It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Uh, this week, starring Ask Michael Anything. Woohoo! <laughs> and there you have it. Thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. You guys were exceptionally good today. How are you guys? Let's see who's in that chat room. Hello, Martin. Hello, Ken, Glenn, Marion, Anne, Patrick, Carrie, Dean, Anne House, Jeremy, Axel, MTP Studios, Burrell, Len, Carl. We will write you a song. Hey, guys. Okay, so, uh, Man, I gotta tell you before I start today's show, which we are going to do, ask Michael anything. Um, my friend Rob Shirelli, who is a Grammy-winning engineer, producer, mixer guy, invited me to come down to a studio for a special thing. So my wife and I went down yesterday. It's a studio in North Hollywood called Sphere Recording. Used to belong to Linda Perry, and now some gentleman from, I believe, Italy or the UK bought it. Anyway, I've worked in a lot of world-class studios. I mean, the biggest. And uh, there aren't that many of them left, to be honest with you, because you can pretty much get everything you need in a laptop these days. This studio was breathtaking, though. It, it was the live room. Man, I'm one of those guys who walks into a restaurant and I clap my hands just to hear, you know, like, what does the room sound like? I'll do it in a church. I don't care if the service is going on. I will clap my hands. And uh, I went in out in the live room yesterday when it was empty, clapped my hands. It had like a perfect half-second decay, just at all the right frequencies, sounded amazing. But the most amazing thing about this place, they probably got like, I don't know, 100 guitar amps there every freaking guitar amp you can think of virtually every piece of outboard you can think of and for those of you who are real outboard junkies they had a pair of fairchild limiters original fairchilds that sell for around forty-five thousand bucks a piece now um oh, i can't oh the mic selection <laughs> something like either four or six original neumann u67s which i think are the best sounding of all the neumanns uh, anyway, it was just, I, I can't explain it. My wife was with me. She's looking at me like, I don't get it, but I got it. So thanks, Rob. Thanks for having us down. It was fun. Um, okay, let's get to some questions. Uh, <laughs> Marion Laird to waves Woo, at all my good friends. Um, okay. Question number one, right off the top. This is from Brad Briglin, and he asks, I'm new to Taxi and only have a few forwards. Well, that's pretty good for a newbie. Uh, last week, a publisher emailed me and wants to use an instrumental that I made. I've been able to pro I have been able to provide, no, sorry, I've been asked to provide a 30-second edit of a two-minute instrumental piece. What does that mean exactly? Um, they want a 30 second version of it because they can probably use it for a tv commercial that way um, so what you want to do is you want to give them something that's got probably the original beginning and something that's got the original end but you want to edit it in the middle so that it makes sense and the whole thing times out and you, you'd be smart to give it to them at 29.5 seconds including the ring out or whatever sort of sustaining note there is at the end you want to be out i mean totally out dead silence by 29.5 the reason is if they use it for a tv commercial at any point in its life um, the computers at the networks that put the commercials together in sequence do hard cuts right at 30 seconds. So if your piece of music is laid into a commercial and the video cuts off, well, actually the whole thing would cut off at uh, you know somewhere around 29.9 um, or 29.9 and some frames to allow for the beginning of the next commercial. So if your ring out extends out further than that, your ring out is gonna get cut. Honestly, I hear it all the time in commercials, probably more often than not, so it's not a huge disaster, but why not give them something that is 
right to begin with. So that's what you want to do is you want to edit it. Now, it could be that because of the tempo of it, uh, that it can't be cut gracefully into a 29.5. So you may want to talk to the publisher and say, I can't give it to you at exactly 29.5 because of the tempo. Um, is it okay if I do it ever so slightly faster or slower so that it times out to that? Um, if all else fails, you could just recut it in a version that works at 29.5. Anyway, I'm sure other people have dandy suggestions for that, but uh, that those are my suggestions. Um, this one is from Glenn Johnson, and he asks, do taxis, clients, the publishers, etc., pay to list with taxi? We get asked that question several times a year, and the answer has always been from day number one, no. The reason we don't charge them as much as I'd like to, and sometimes for some of them I feel like we should, um, it's a lot of work what we do for them, but the reason we don't is we want to bring you guys as many opportunities as we possibly can. So by us not charging them, that eliminates a barrier that might be a barrier for some companies. They may not have the budget. They may not want to spend the money um, to do a search. So we've always made it free for them. Uh, let's see. John Quick asks, can you remake the submission page, uh, the taxi submission page on the website, I'm pre assuming, so we can use PayPal for the submission fee? Even if you make the fee using PayPal $5.50 with the extra $0.50 cents to cover the PayPal commission. Um, it's coming. We, are, we have been working, uh, as you guys know, doing various aspects of the website in chunks at a time. And uh, we did, I think it was December, we did a whole bunch of back-end stuff that you guys probably don't see. Maybe some of it is on the front end that you do see. But I think that our next round of uh, new iterations going to be, I want to say, in May. So coming up soon. Um, I don't know if the submissions aspect is going to be in the feature set for uh, the May go round. But I can tell you that the programmer has absolutely guaranteed me that that stuff will be done in time for the road rally in November. And our goal is to make it like one or two clicks to do a submission. So you'll be able to grab your phone when you get an email while you're at work <coughs> uh, and see a listing and go, okay, that song for that listing, boom, and it'll go. Um, the credit card number will be stored. It won't be stored with us. We want nothing to do with that but um, the processor will know. Just like when you go to Amazon, do one click, it'll be very similar to that. Um, so we're excited about that because we know you guys have wanted it for a long time. Okay, um, Steven asks, I love Taxi and Taxi TV. Thank you, Steven. We love you even though I don't know your last name. Um, Let's see, I've learned so much about songwriting and being able to get professional feedback is invaluable. But I still suck. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I've got a long way to go. That's okay. Um, I think the membership fee is a great value, but for someone like me, it's a huge layout for a hobby I can't spend as much time on as I'd like. It's like paying for an annual gym membership and only getting to go a few times a year. Um, yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> I know it well. Um, I was wondering if Taxi might be able to consider adding another tier of membership, a nominal membership fee of, say, $50 with no uh, road show. I think he means road rally tickets or other benefits, um, but with a much higher submission fee. I'd be happy to pay $15 to $20 per submission and $40 to $50 for a custom critique. On this basis, my first year membership would have cost me more, so I'm not asking for any freebies. Well, dude, that totally flies in the face of what you're asking for. <laughs> your first year co would have cost you more if you'd done it the way you're suggesting we do it. Some suggestions might not be as good as you think. Um, but if I don't manage to get anything to submit, it would cost less, working more like pay as you go. I realize this might not be at all possible, but I just thought I'd ask. Uh, it's a good question. It's something that we've toyed with over the years. We've talked about um, just charging more per submission, but Frank, uh, and, and doing away with the membership fee. Um, 
frankly, I think that we'd get a gazillion submissions. And, and one of the reasons that we haven't done that charging, like, you know, no membership fee and $25 a submission, is I think a lot of people would take pot shots. A lot of people would be sending in crazy submissions because 25 bucks is pretty painless. The $300, which frankly, um, our expenses have more than doubled in the years, 26 years since I started the company, and I'm kind of amazed we've been able to keep it at 300 bucks a year. But what the 300 bucks a year does other than keep the business afloat is that it dissuades people who aren't serious about their music. We have never, ever wanted to be that company, and there are others out there that do this, that are you know preying on people's dreams um and and they're all about making the quick buck taxi has always been about presenting real opportunities great opportunities and the education aspect to bring people along so it's not just hey you're not good enough yet um you may not be good enough yet but we will help you become good enough if you just go to the gym <laughs> so for that reason we charge three hundred dollars but i can't say i'll never say never you know it we could potentially change the business model or the pricing structure someday and frankly a really good friend of mine in the industry somebody i'm very very close to that runs another very very large company that's been around forever and all of you guys know the company and probably know him um Every time I'm with him, he's like chewing me out, going, Lasco, I cannot believe that you people are still charging 300 bucks a year. You should be charging like $500 a year for all that you do. So we hang in there 300 bucks a year. We provide a lot of value in the form of the road rally, taxi TV, the forums, the feedback, all that stuff. Uh, it's pretty rewarding for us when people, we, we watch them go from being like, a three out of 10 to being a nine out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. We love it when people um, become successful. And we had a big part in that, you know, it's, it's like a teacher um, teaching kids how to read in the first grade. That's gotta be rewarding. So we love what we do and we're not changing the pricing structure this week. Um, Carrie Hartgen asks, I'm prepared to wait and work through the three to five years it usually takes to start seeing income from taxi submissions. But in the meantime, can you give us some ideas about how we can support our composing habit with the music we create, other than performing? Um, thanks, Michael, and thanks as always for the support and the opportunities you give to musicians. I'm stumped, I gotta say, Carrie. Um, I mean, other than, well, if. <laughs> You know, there's Taxi submitting your music for records or film and TV kind of stuff. Um, if you take performing out of it, what else is there? Um, I, I, I literally am stumped. <laughs> I don't know what else there is. There's, you know, the recording side of the industry, the performance side of the industry. I guess you could write out charts and sell sheet music, but if people don't know your music, why would they buy the sheet music? So, I don't know. I wish I had a good answer for you, but I don't. Um, if I think of one, I'll mention it on a future show. Uh, Ray Gentner asks, do you work with car companies? I have some good songs for commercials. Uh, we do occasionally. Um, I would say probably 20 or 30 percent maybe of all the uh, requests that we get for music for commercials. Uh, liquor, you know, beer, soft drinks, uh, beverages of all sorts actually. And, and car commercials are probably the most frequently um, the types of companies that come to us through the ad agencies and want music. Um, I'm curious to know, Ray, or, or, or Ryan, I'm sorry, are you in the chat room if you are? Raise your hand. Because um, I want to know, when you say you have some good songs for commercials, um, what kind of songs are they? Uh, are they songs about, you know, I love my car because she's got four on the floor? Because um, that kind of stuff, you know, that's kind of jingly and maybe too specific or too on the nose. And the stuff that generally works, for, it depends on the brand and the kind of car. If you think about it, think of uh, Mercedes. Rarely, if ever, have they used a song, but they do use very classy um, 
mood music, you know, the, with the headlights on, driving through the curves of a mountain, you know, on some windy road in the middle of the night, and the music is very classy and inspiring and sort of anthemic. Um, uh, Subaru, on the other hand, does use songs, and their songs are all somehow connected to the theme of love, which is their their thing, you know. Um, it's part of their branding is love. So Subaru's stuff could be about, you know, there's commercial where the um, 20-something couple is going out for a weekend of camping, and, and the adorable 20-something girl brings her adorable dog and her adorable boyfriend who doesn't get along with the dog is trying to make nice and eventually ends up with the dog putting its head on his lap while they're sitting by a campfire and the song is about love so there you go that's what they're trying to instill viewers with is a sense of love to build a connection because they're not selling you sheet metal they're not selling you speed they're not selling you safety they're not selling you the ultimate driving machine they have chosen to make that part of their brand is buy a subaru because of love because the people you put in it you love them because it fosters love in a relationship and it makes dogs love you doesn't get any better than that speaking of cars uh I saw a car, it's a concept car, but it is rumored to be coming out in 2018. It's called the Mazda Vision. Google Mazda Vision and look for that car in red. It also, I saw like charcoal gray. I gotta tell you, and they say it's gonna be about a fifty to $60,000 car. It's friggin' gorgeous. I spent the better part of my weekend with my phone in my hand going, Look at that, honey. Look at that car. Gotta have that car. <laughs> Jeez, just look, I don't get it. My wife, seriously, if you put a $300,000 car in front of her and a $30,000 car in front of her, she wouldn't know which one is which, and she could care less. Gotta love that. She's a very inexpensive wife most of the time. Hope you're watching, honey. Um, Casey Hurwitz, Hurwitz asks, where did you get those sneakers? Why, Casey, which sneakers? What the hell are you talking about? I see he's talking about in the picture for the episode. You had your feet up on the... Oh. <laughs> I forgot that you took a picture with me, my feet up on the desk the other day. Um, did I have on my brand new really white sneakers? Right, yeah. Um, I can tell you exactly where I got those sneakers. Uh, can you make a little cooler? I think the air conditioner, it's that time of day where it decides to just shut off because it can. Um, it's like a convection oven in my office. It's sickening. Um, anyway, uh, where did I get those sneakers? Okay, those were, I don't have them on today, so I can't look at the label. Um, they're Converse, but they're not All-Stars. They're the tennis version of the Converse All-Star, kind of. Uh, with the name of a famous tennis player on them, and I can't remember his name. But I bought a pair years ago, and it was the only time in my life where people would walk up to me and say, those are awesome sneakers. And they happened to feel great, and I liked them, and they lasted forever. So I did what I always do when I find something I love. I buy like three of them. So I bought three pairs of those sneakers, and the ones you saw in that photo the other day had been sitting in my closet for 10 years in a box, and I pulled them out, and there they were in their virginal white glory, and I wore them to work the other day. It happened to be the day that Bria took a picture of me sitting at my desk. So now you know, Casey. Um, James Henry wants to know, does the name that I give to my instrumental cue affect it? Does the name that I give to my instrumental cue affects if it gets, oh, does it affect if it gets pitched or not? Um, is it better to have a short name for your piece? So I'm gonna take that in the, uh, kind of as two questions. So yeah, I am a big believer and maybe the first really vocal public proponent of really thinking hard about what you're gonna name your cues. Um, and it's a, become a thing that's caught on. Um, here's why it matters. Uh, especially for instrumental cues that are likely to get used in um, reality TV shows. And that is because uh, in a lot of people's mind's eye, they, they sit there and they 
imagine that a music supervisor is sitting there listening to three or four or five pieces of music and making a very thoughtful choice as they listen from the beginning to the end and that piece of music hmm I really like that those marimbas are awesome and the maracas oh baby oh baby I love that piece of music now let's listen to another one and then they thoughtfully consider that one and the next and the next the truth is that the music supervisor in most cases for reality TV will go through a pre-approved library that the production company has signed off on and made a deal with probably a blanket license which means they pay a flat fee of like 10 or 20 or 30 grand a year for an all you can eat in other words anything they want to use out of that library can get slugged into any shows on that network or any shows done by that production company or this specific show so the pre-approved library goes to the music supervisor who has met in advance with the showrunner who is generally the executive producer of the show often the person who came up with the idea and oversees the whole production of the show and they sit down together and talk about the musical signature of the show what's the personality going to be is it going to be quirky and fun is it going to be a little serious and heavy-handed or dark and they make that determination they come up with what they think will work as the musical signature for the show and then they take the music supervisor doesn't actually pick each piece of music that goes into each scene rather the music supervisor then goes through the library and picks stuff that he or she thinks will work in the context of what was decided with the showrunner they put that music into what are called bins basically it's an imaginary bucket if you will it's kind of an electronic bucket or a file that sits uh, on a hard drive uh, or some sort of drive um, it's often mutually accessible to two or three or four or five editors that are all working on the same show at the same time and when they go to lay in music so it's the actual video editor that lays in the music the video editor then makes a decision let's say that the video editor comes up to a scene that's about somebody falling out of a boat or no somebody trying to water ski and they're trying to stand up over they go and they try to stand up again over they go try to stand up again over they go so the music under those three fails would probably be something almost like circus music something that you might hear you know that kind of stuff something funny quirky comedic in nature and then let's say on the fourth attempt the water skiing person actually stands up then you want something that's heroic or anthemic so if you're the person creating the music um, you want to come up with titles that when that video editor who may or may not be a musician him or herself is looking at a list of thousands of cues now granted they're segregated um, by you know uh, different genres but a video editor may not know what a genre sounds like their job is not to be a genre expert their job is to be a video editing expert so but let's say they look under I don't know hip-hop um, because they feel like hip-hop would be kind of cool and modern and you know of the moment and so they want to put a piece of hip-hop music in for that moment when the water skier is actually successful at standing up so that is um, uh, an heroic moment um, it, you might want something anthemic or heroic so you would look uh, and you see you know a piece of music called Sophie's Choice and you go I don't know what that is or um, I'm trying you know uh, taxis all day or lights in the ceiling or wooden tabletops uh, those are all just random titles and we see stuff like that every day we also see stuff like you know um, instrumental cue 90 seconds mix one with a date some people actually title their stuff like that because that's how they remember it best but the best thing you can do for titling your music, and I know this is a long-winded answer, but I've still got an hour of the show to fill, so I'm giving you everything I got here. Why not name that cue um, um, Hero's Choice or Hero's Conquer or Conquering Your Fear or Conquering My Fear or Conquering the Mountain or 
coming out on top. That way, if you're a video editor and you're not musically inclined and you don't know genres, but you do know the emotional thing that you're going for in the scene and you're going down a list and you see Sophie's Choice and Wooden Tabletop and Light in the Ceiling and all those other dumb names I came up with and all of a sudden you come to Conquering Hero. Well, I've got to listen to that one because that might be something that would work well under somebody who just conquered, you know, their epic fails at standing up on water skis and they play the music and boom, it works from a musical standpoint. Why did they find it? Why did they pick it out of dozens or hundreds or even thousands of other cues that are staring them in the face? Because it had a great title. So I hope that answers the question well. I'm a big believer in that, in case you couldn't tell. Um, and the second part of that was, is it better to have a short name for your piece? Um, reasonably short. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, one or two words necessarily, unless the one or two words are really um, extremely well targeted and powerful, like um, Conquering Hero, pretty darn short pretty darn descriptive. Uh, if the title was um, Music for People Who Accomplish Tasks They Previously Failed At, I don't think even though that's long and really descriptive, it's probably not as good as Conquering Hero. Um, so I hope that helps. Um, that was a really good question. At least I think it's good because I really like the answers. Um, Let's see, Danny Weber asks, if a music library offers a deal for a track that is not in your primary genre, what is the best way to approach that library with music that comes from the genre you are most comfortable with? Thank you, Michael. So I think what Danny's saying is he may have had some contact with a library and the production music library says, hey, we're looking for hip hop and Danny doesn't do hip hop but he would like to take that opportunity or seize upon that and say, hey, I don't have any hip hop, excuse me, but I do happen to have some really good acoustic singer songwriter style stuff. Can I send you that? And to that, I would say, going back to the shoe theme because Casey brought it up, um, I used to be shoe salesman. Uh, and believe it or not, that job, I did it when I was 14 and 15 years old, and I did it again when I was 18 years old. Um, and frankly, I really liked being a shoe salesperson. Do you know, there's a little known thing about being a, a shoe guy, um, and that is that you have to know how to reorder the inventory on the shelves in the stockroom because everything is sequential. Um, and it goes up and it goes down, it goes up and it goes down, it goes up and it goes down, and it goes by style and it goes by size and sometimes by color. So if you've got your entire stock room, uh, the word I used was ordinated, <laughs> and, uh, and now, you know, hush puppies send something in a chocolate brown suede, um, and you've already got hush puppies in a tan suede, you have to then take those 14 pairs of Hush Puppies and Chocolate Brown and insert those into the Hush Puppy section of the stock room. There may be a thousand other shoes in the shelf before it and a thousand other shoes after it. So now you've got to move everything down 14 spots to squeeze the new ones in. And then one by one, stuff gets sold off. It gets pulled out, sold off, pulled out, sold off. So you're constantly readjusting your inventory to keep it orderly. So there you go, a little bit of shoe stuff. So here's why that's relevant to this, which is if a person walks into a shoe store and says, I need a men's black Oxford in a nine and a half D with a wingtip toe, and you bring out a lady's potassoi pump which uh, those are the fabric shoes that you can dye to match a bridesmaid's dress. And there are very few straight men that actually know that, but I know any shoe guy would know that. Um, and, and you bring out a lady's pump in a seven and a half B, the dude sitting in the chair is gonna look at you like, what the hell? Why did you bring me a lady's pump in a seven and a half B when I told you I wanted a men's black Oxford with a wingtip and a nine and a half D? The same thing is true most of the time can't say 100% of the time, but most of the time when somebody asks for something, 
They really do, because you're not the only person in the world, believe it or not, they know other musicians. So imagine if all the other musicians they know are saying, I don't have any hip hop. I don't have the nine and a half D men's black Oxford with a wingtip, but I do have this other thing. It's like, that's not what they're looking for. On occasion, it will work. The more attached you are, uh, the stronger your relationship is with that library owner, the better chance you have of slipping something in like that. But I would do it very occasionally. Um, you're just so much better off giving them what they ask for. But, you know, after you've known them for a year or two and you've been successful at getting stuff in their catalog and they've been successful at getting some placements and you're a money maker for them, you know, it certainly couldn't hurt sometimes. I wouldn't do it in response to them looking for hip hop and trying to send them um, the other stuff. But, you know, it couldn't hurt to send them uh, an email once or twice a year. This is, by the way, I just finished a project doing a bunch of acoustic singer songwriter style cues. Uh, can I send you one or two and let me know if you want to hear the rest? They would probably say yes to that because they would trust you to not be a bonehead. And, and that trust is important. So there you go. Um, Dustin Hovermail. Uh, or maybe Hovermail, uh, says, Michael, hi, Michael. Glad I got my first taxi forward, as are we. Um, have not heard back from them yet. Could be a while, maybe never. Just because you got forwarded doesn't mean you're going to get a deal, but it does mean you're on the desk, figuratively speaking, probably more than likely on a, on a laptop or a desktop of a computer. Um, do you work with whiskey companies? I have a song that would be great called Love and Whiskey. Um, yeah, we've run a, I mean, we don't work directly with the whiskey companies. We work with the ad agencies that do commercials for whiskey companies. Not that often. Uh, and frankly, most of the, the liquor, uh, not beer necessarily, but and not wine necessarily, but the liquor commercials I find um, usually come to us sometime around July, August, September, and those are usually for Christmassy uh, commercials because people like to bring a bottle of booze with them when they go to somebody's house for the holidays. Got to get granny drunk, right? Um, so, but again, this is a case of maybe being too on the nose. Love and whiskey, um, you know, chances are, it, let's say it's Jack Daniels, okay? That's whiskey, right? Or is that bourbon? I'm not sure. Eh, it's brown and it gets you drunk. It's whiskey. Okay, Bria knows. <laughs> Aren't you proud of your kid? <laughs> I said that to your dad who's watching the show. I see Neil in the chat room. <laughs> yes, your daughter knows the difference between whiskey and bourbon. But then again, it might be. Yeah, now she's recanting. I love it. <laughs> okay, anyway, um, where was I? <laughs> I got flustered by my own self. Oh, love and whiskey. Okay, usually, uh, let's say it's a Jack Daniels commercial. Chances are it's going to be something like bluegrass, you know? It's going to be um, background music. It's probably going to be a voiceover person with a really cool you know, kind of woodsy sounding voice with a little bit of a drawl talking about, you know, we've aged it in oak barrels for 32 years kind of stuff. Or the people, whatever town Jack Daniels is made in, talking about the townspeople that work there. It's not like a jingle, hey, love and whiskey, drink our stuff, it's great. That doesn't really happen much anymore. Uh, frankly, love and whiskey is probably more likely to get used as background music in a bar scene, background source music. And, and I'm going to explain what background source is in case you're not a regular watcher of the show. Background source means it's coming ostensibly coming from a source. For instance, there are two people having a conversation in a you know dusty roadhouse bar with peanut shells on the floor and the stench of beer and cigarettes in the air and they're having a discussion and you hear music you probably can't even tell what the lyrics are you can't really identify the song you can probably listen carefully and go oh that's country you know or that's rock so yeah love and whiskey might be the kind of song that would play well as background source music for a scene like that 
Okay. Um, Gabriel, pardon me if I butcher this, Gabriel Lataro Os Osuna asks, how do I submit something I've written? Oh, this is a great question. I saw this one before the show. How do I submit something I've written with a co-writer? Many taxi listings say you must own or control 100% of the rights. Make note, we actually took out 100%. It's no longer in our listings unless it's a part of an old listing that we recycled or something. But it should be the case now that you'll never see 100%. And we did it exactly because of what you're asking. It confused people. They thought, oh, I have to be 100% on this song. No, it meant that you need to control 100%, which is kind of a, a bit of a misnomer anyway. Bottom line is, yes, you can submit anything that you write or co-write. So let's say, for instance, that Bria and I co-write a song. Um, either one of us technically could submit that song. It's 50-50. Um, let's say that Bria and I and a third person write a song and that the splits were 33 and a third each. Um, I think, and I could be wrong, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm pretty sure that any one of the three of us could pitch that song anywhere um, and you could pitch it to taxi. So you don't need to actually own 100% of it. That's why we took that out. Um, you need to have control. Now, it doesn't mean by you having control that the other people don't. It could be, it's more of like we each have the ability. It's probably a better word, but it just didn't make sense in the context of a listing. So I hope that helps. Um, and no, your, your co-writer does not have to be a member of Taxi, but I could technically double our revenue if I said yes. Every song you submit um, needs to have the co-writer be a Taxi member, but no, that's not the case. Um, let's see, there was more to this question. I wanna make sure I covered it here. Uh, become involved in learning about what writing producing. I've seen lots of emphasis on collaborative writing at the Road Rally, for example. I've even watched Taxi TV episodes where writing duo, team, where writing duo teams have been featured. How do I work out the copyright and licensing in this situation? So ba basically, the rule of thumb is, um, it's usually a 50-50 if it's two people. Um, there are other arrangements made. Sometimes somebody could have something substantially finished, but it's missing something. And they reach out to a collaborator through the taxi forum or the road rally or whatever means they have. And they say, hey, I, I really like what I've got so far, but I need something to finish this off. And the other person uh, comes up with something great and it's now complete and it's wonderful and it's getting pitched. You as the initial writer who substantially created that thing may say to the other collaborator, um, how do you feel about a 75-25 because I really did most of this. But I will say that most of the time it's a 50-50. Uh, there's kind of an unspoken rule in Nashville that uh, if you're in the room, you get an equal share. So if there are three writers in the room and it happens to be the day that, you know, you're doing like the, the coffee pouring um, and sitting there playing drums on your chair while the other two folks in the room are the ones who substantially came up with the song, you're still gonna get a third because you were there. And the, the theory in Nashville, and I believe it's a good theory, is that while you may be the coffee-pouring, chair-thumping dude today on this co-write with three people in the room, could be a month from now, six months from now, six years from now, the three of you are back in the room again, and you're the one that brings the goods. And that the other person who was more substantially involved last time around is now the coffee-pouring, chair-thumping dude. So it all kind of works out in the end. So that's the rule of thumb in Nashville. I think that rule has been around for a long time and most people are pretty happy with it. Um, Brian Timmons asks, uh, I've been a member for five years and had 12 songs get past the screeners. Um, I've yet to get any response from a potential buyer. Um, I don't doubt that you guys know what you're looking for. My question is, do you know what you're asking for? <laughs> and that was my version of the stink eye, um, <laughs> or the confused eye. Um, 
do you know what you're asking for? You say don't copy. Oh, this is now I'm getting it. You say you, you say don't copy in the listings. We say Taxi says don't copy any of the sample artists or songs, but it seems as though you want something as close as possible without being sued. Um, I can't tell you how frustrating that is for a real songwriter, as opposed to a fake one, um, that tries so hard to do original material. Just an observation, I have six days to renew my membership debating with myself. Okay, here's the deal, Brian. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a delicate way to say this. Uh, the industry wants stuff that sounds like what's happening now on radio most of the time. Or they might, let's say they're working on a show that's about, you know, the, the early 70s. They may say, we're, uh, we want something that's in the wheelhouse of or the ballpark of or would be found on a playlist with Led Zeppelin. So even they don't really want a copy of Led Zeppelin. Uh, I mean, I won't say that I've never come across this. Sometimes they do want sound-alikes, and they will try and kind of sweep it under the rug that it's a sound-alike. But look, nobody, I don't think most people are inclined to be dishonest. Um, my daughter once asked my wife and I at dinner, she said, you and mommy are always talking about having good character. What does that mean? And while my wife and I looked at each other trying to think of how to you know, address that back to a six-year-old or something, uh, my daughter stopped us and she said, actually, I think I do know what it means. It means doing the right thing even when nobody else can see you. So I feel the same way about musicians, that I don't think most musicians are naturally inclined to want to steal somebody else's art. I think accidentally it happens quite frequently. I know if I were a songwriter, I think that everything would sound like some like music from the mid '70s, which is still my like golden era. Um, so it does happen by accident. However, when we give references in the listings, there are a couple different ways that those listings can be used, and it does take some time, not just inside of Taxi and our little ecosystem, but in the industry in general, because the industry has always used what are called alas. Publisher tip sheets, record label tip sheets have gone out for as long as I've been in the industry, which is like 43, 44 years now, where they've always said, you know, uh, music a la Cat Stevens, or music a la Led Zeppelin, or a song a la Stairway to Heaven. That means that they're looking for something that's got the vibe and the spirit and the general sound. Um, so let's think about Led Zeppelin. Let's go back to that example for a minute. Um, it's got big, raucous, smacking drums. It's got um, crunchy, bluesy rock guitars. It's got a lot of swagger in, in the vocal. Um, so those elements, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for something that's got the spirit of it. Now there are times where they've already tempted in a song into a scene in a movie or a TV show. And it could, be, or a commercial, and it could be something that rhythmically goes with the beat uh, of the editing. Um, and just works well in the scene. There are times where we will drop a heavy hint on you guys because there's no harm or no legal foul that I'm aware of that says that you can't match the tempo of something. So matching the tempo is one thing. Matching the raucous nature of the drums, also fine. Matching the um, kind of bluesy, you know, studly guitar work uh, Jimmy Page would do. Nothing wrong with that either. It's when you're copying the melody in the lyric that you get yourself into some serious trouble. So I, I know there was a case with, uh, I can't ever remember the band, but um, there was a case probably seven or eight years ago where a band sued somebody, some entity or person, for copying their sound. Um, I don't know how they did with that case, honestly, but I know that a lot of that goes on. So people do want stuff that's in the vibe of, in the spirit of, in the wheelhouse of, in the ballpark of, but they're generally not looking for a copy of. 
so now you're an original creator, and apparently this, and I don't, I'm not saying this sarcastically, but it, it insults your artistic integrity a bit that, it's like, why don't they want me? Don't they want to hear my original voice, my original creation? And I get that. As a creator, you want your thing to be the thing that's out there. You want people to appreciate you and your art and your craft and not your ability to imitate somebody else's. Um, I, I totally get that. I respect it. And there's nothing that gets me more excited than a beautifully crafted song. All that said, get over it. Um, the industry wants what the industry wants. And you know what? Just because you're going to give them that song that's in the same spirit, vibe, ballpark, or wheelhouse of Led Zeppelin doesn't mean that you have to stop creating the stuff that you do. Just understand that the number of opportunities for your original thing, which probably has an original sound of its own, that my and my guess is, I'm not picking on you in particular, just a vast number of people that I know from experience, when they say, I've got something original, generally it wouldn't fit on a chart. It doesn't fit with any known genre. It's an amalgamation thereof. And you go, well, why isn't that good? Why shouldn't my music be an amalgamation of a bunch of things? And frankly, look, Led Zeppelin is an amalgamation of old blues artists and some rock guys. Um, the Beatles were an amalgamation of other people. It's when you amalgamate, <laughs> I don't even know if that's a word, but when you're amalgam, <laughs> that's the noun, uh, when what you put together becomes unidentifiable as a genre, it can't go on a playlist. And if it can't go on a playlist, then it can't go in a bin for an editor to use. It can't go on a radio station because there are rock stations, there are urban music stations, there are country music stations, there are classical music stations. So if you've got music that is a hybrid of classical and country, who's gonna play that? The country station or the classical station? I know you'd like to think both of them would, but they won't. They're going to stick with stuff that appeals to their core audience because that's what people show up expecting to hear. When they tune into a country station, they want to hear country music. Uh, you would think, well, why don't they want to hear something new that tests the boundaries and, and um, is something totally new and captivating? Um, and now and again, something comes along. What was that song uh, by Gautier? Um, they had like Somebody one. Somebody I used to know. Yeah, that somebody I used to know. That was pretty darn original. That was very original. It was one of those few things that bust through, and people are going to say, "Oh yeah, but the Beatles—they were very original for their time, uh, very unique." There are always exceptions. I'll grant you that. But if you want to earn a living with your music, would you rather be the rare, and I'm talking extremely like one in a thousand, one in 10,000, one in a hundred thousand, or one in a million exception that gets you know the paycheck, or would you rather be the person like, I'm gonna say Matt Vanderbilt. Um, guy was able to quit being a college professor because he's earning enough money making music now and his income constantly going up. Uh, and he does it not by being original, but by basically imitating a style and doing, imitating with some originality. He finds a new twist. He'll take um, uh, dramedy, you know, uh, dramedy music. Generally speaking, dramedy is like that do do do. Boom, 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 pizzicato stuff, sneaking around, you know, looking in the windows. I think it became popularized with, uh, uh, what was the show about the uh, people in the cul-de-sac? Um, the ladies were always peeking in each other's windows. You guys, somebody will know it. Um, Bria was probably still a baby when that show was popular, but uh, I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, that popularized dramedy, the whole pizzicato, do, 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 sneaking around thing. So Matt Vanderbo um, became very expert at taking uh, dramedy music and combining that with hip hop because there are shows like Love and Hip Hop or uh, Filthy Rich Housewives of Atlanta or whatever. And those are mostly shows that appeal to urban audiences. So they like hip hop, but they still needed the dramedy aspect. So you put the two together and what do you get? You get um, urban dramedy. 
and there's a lot of need for that. So he was able to be creative and create something that earned money. Uh, could he stop doing music at five o'clock? Look, he could be digging ditches. He could be a librarian. He could be a college professor. He could be a dentist. He could be a lot of things. But he chose to be a musician, and that's his day job. And he's very, very fortunate in that he gets to earn his living doing something he loves as his desperate housewives. Thank you. Uh, several of you chimed in with that, desperate housewives. So, um, you know, Matt Vanderboom, many, many, many of our successful members do music now as their day job. It, it, they can work till five o'clock, six o'clock, stop, have dinner, and then go back in the studio and create their grand opus, their music that is totally them, totally original. That thing that they hope someday is a genre-bending hit that is Gautier or is the Beatles or is something that's new and breaks through and, and redefines the industry. The chances of that happening, really, really, really small. Um, that was a long answer. Again, I've got plenty of time. <laughs> uh, do you have a bunch more questions so I should speed things up? Um, Not so much? We have a decent amount of questions, but I would okay. say I'm, I'm oh, man. a good amount of time. Okay, so I'm on my last page here. Um, you should have. Oh, no. You should have three more pages. Holy smokes, I do. Okay. Um, Anyway, I hope that answers your question, Brian. Um, sorry for being so long-winded, but it's a deep question. It's a good question. Um, yeah, earn money doing what people ask for that's not all that original by day and do your original stuff at night. That way you can be supported doing what you love, waiting for that moment where you can break through doing something you love even more. There's the bumper sticker. Uh, David Radburn asks, I don't understand the term or word sync fees. Could you explain as I plan to join Taxi and Gin? This one's easy. Good question. Um, and, you know, oftentimes I'm probably guilty of assuming because we've got such a, a regular audience that people that watch the show know a lot of this stuff, but we get a lot of new folks watching. So I'm really glad you asked on behalf of yourself and all of them. And that is, um, I don't understand the the term or the word sync fees. Well, a sync fee means the amount of money, it's a fee that you get paid for granting somebody the license to synchronize your music to picture. So let's go back to the bar in a TV show. We're in a roadhouse bar and they need a song about love and whiskey. And our friend who asked the question earlier has got the perfect song for that. And so the music supervisor would say, I want to license your song for this scene. And the sync fee is $500. That means that the musician gets an upfront payment of $500. So the next question is, well, how much do sync fees range? It's a lot of stuff that happens. Almost virtually all, not 100%, but virtually all the music you hear in uh, reality shows, the vast, vast, vast majority of it, there's no sync fee whatsoever paid up front. That was all started by MTV back in the probably late 80s, early 90s, um, and it caught on. But you make money from your performance royalties on the back end through ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC in America. There are other uh, PROs, as they're called, performing rights organizations in other countries. Even Canada has one. I did that to get Bria's attention. <laughs> Uh, and Neil McTavish is drinking whatever his, his vodka right now and laughing his butt off. But yes, uh, you know, like France has Sassem. Um, what does Canada have? Uh, you don't know. Uh, you've got Canadian blood. Um, uh, Canada, Sassem is France. I don't know. Anyway, um, APRA is Australia. Um, uh, Neil left already. Oh, well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Performing rights organizations get the back end so stuff. Uh, what? So can. Oh, so can. Thank you. I should know that. Um, anyway, each country has it own, its own. I believe America is the only country that's got three that compete with each other ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. So, sync fee is what you get paid up front. Sync fee could be $0, it could be 100 bucks. it could be 200 bucks, $500. Typically, reality shows don't pay a sync fee. 
Um, dramatic television generally pays a thousand to three thousand somewhere in that range and, and I'm talking for folks like you not famous people that have stuff on the charts but regular old people uh, musicians uh, so you'd get a thousand to three thousand bucks typically um, get something in a movie you might get like twenty five hundred to seven thousand ish that's kind of typical range um, of course it also depends is it something that's in the background? You get less. Is it something that's featured and up front? You get more. Is it something that plays for a really long period of time? You get more. So all these variables are things that affect how much you get paid for the sync fee. Um, if you get your music in a commercial, we just had one that paid uh, 200000 Although in advertising, they generally don't call it a sync fee. It's called a creative fee. Um, we generally refer to it in listings as a sync fee because we don't want people to be confused and it really is the same thing with a different name. And when you get the sync fee, it means that they're licensing what they say, what they call both sides. That doesn't mean like the A side and the B side of a 45. What it means is the two sides means the publishing side and the master recording side because they're licensing the recording of the song and they're licensing the use of the composition which is the copyrighted thing. So let's say that a music supervisor says to you, I'll give you um, 3,000 uh, bucks for both sides to use your song in an episode of whatever, Homeland. Um, which great episode of Homeland last night for those of you who are fellow Homeland watchers. Um, that means that they're, the, they won't license just one side. They can't license just the, the copyright or just the master recording. They've got to have the whole package. Now, it could be a case where a publishing company owns 100% of the publisher share and they control the copyright, yet you own the recording. So they would have to split that $3,000 sync fee and say, here you go, publisher, you get 1500 bucks, and Michael, the songwriter, you get 1500 bucks. most of the time. A lot of times, it's the same person. So hopefully, um, there you go. I hope that answers the question. Okay, the next question is impossible to um, answer, but it's from a, a very famous historic figure named Patrick Adams. Um, and Patrick wants to know, what's a good starter tube mic and tube preamp for less than a thousand bucks? Patrick, there's so much more that I need to know. Are you in the chat room? I hope you are because I really want to answer this question. Oh, great. Uh, uh, Adriana just pointed out, thank you for saying that. It's something we added recently. Um, we added a glossary. Um, so if you look at the bottom navigation, there's a bunch of it at the bottom of the, the entire Taxi website. There's somewhere probably like the third column from the left. It says uh, Music Industry Glossary or something like that. Link in oh, great. Bria's going to pop a link in. Um, Patrick Adams. Yes, I'm here. Okay, Patrick. So what I want to know is um, why do you feel that you need a tube mic and a tube preamp? Are, are you relatively advanced in your recording chops um, and I mean, obviously you want the sound of tubes, but I guess I'm trying to find out, are you advanced enough in your skill set as it relates to home recording that you feel like um, having a tube mic and a tube preamp would substantially uh, improve the sound of what you're doing? For those of you who are watching later, yes, I'm staring at the thing. That's why. Um, I'm, oh, yeah, that's right. But last week, the because of all technical difficulties, the uh, chat didn't show up. Yeah. Um, where'd Patrick go? Come back, Patrick. Probably Maybe his feed is. All right. Anyway. Um, Mojo mentioned it, and I'm going to mention it again in case you didn't see his comment, which is there's a, there are a lot of plugins out there now. There are actually some microphone and software combinations where you can emulate 
a bunch of different microphones um, and I've not used any of them but I've spoken to people whose judgment I trust and they are shockingly surprised at how good those things sound. While they may not sound a hundred percent like a you know a 67 Neumann, a Neumann U67 II microphone may not sound exactly like that. From what I hear they sound pretty darn close. So <laughs> Patrick said, sorry, my wife called, I'm back. I'm sorry, but when my wife calls during Taxi TV, I ignore her, if I can get away with it. Anyway, um, okay, so the question is, why do you feel why you need a tube mic? Um, are you pretty darn good at home recording and you feel like you're ready to move up to that level? Um, and tube mic for what? for vocals, for guitars, um, different mics for... Looking for a good vocal and acoustic guitar. Okay. Um, honestly, you don't need to spend the money on a tube mic and a tube preamp to do that. Um, you just really don't. And, and everybody's got an opinion. But I will tell you that I have heard... Um, <laughs> Elle Harrison says, we love you, Michael, frozen face or not. Thank you. Um, <laughs> You know what? There are several ways to tackle this issue. First of all, um, I've heard from literally hundreds of taxi members that the Gage ECM 87, which used to retail for like 150 bucks, I think now it's 300 bucks, but people swear by that microphone, and I know a lot of your fellow members who are in the chat room own it. It's a really high value, good, solid sounding microphone that happens to sound and work really well, really well on vocals and acoustic guitars. So, you know, for pretty cheap entry fee, you're fine. Um, Audio Technica. It's the voice of Taxi TV. Um, Look, I'm, I'm using an AT, I don't even know the model number on it. Somebody gave it to me forever, like a million years ago. Um, but I've never heard anything but great stuff about Audio-Technica mics. And I know that people love them on vocals and on acoustic guitars. And this one's a USB mic that just plugs right into the computer. It doesn't even need an interface or a preamp or anything. So all that said is there are a million opinions. And the best thing you can do is to borrow them or rent them but uh, until you find something that you love um, but I would say that you can try oh I think Shirelli uh, go to uh, what's the final mix software um, Rob Shirelli sells a plugin that's probably like 30 bucks that I believe is a mic emulator what give me a sec okay yeah Bree has got to google this um, it's a mic emulator? Yeah, does he have a mic emulator on there? Okay, we've got Mixbus EQ, Westlake EQ, Mastering EQ, Mixbus Slime. I feel like he does, but give me a sec. All right, I could be wrong about that, but there are plenty. Um, I know that uh, Slate ha has a microphone that's got software, and, and it has an incredibly good reputation. It's probably not cheap, but for emulating just about any kind of microphone you could possibly want, um, I would try that. Just saying, um, there is no easy answer because it depends. I mean, frankly, if you're recording an acoustic guitar up close and it's capoed, um, I might pick a different mic for that than I would for somebody that's playing a non-capoed acoustic uh, with open chords, uh, you know, that wants a roomier sound. I would choose a different microphone for that. So just having a tube microphone and a tube preamp doesn't solve all your problems. I would try it in software and see if that pleases you enough. Um, and if it does, and at some point you feel like you wanna, you know, your go-to thing, let's say is an emulation of 
a Neumann tube 67, which those are really expensive now. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm guessing that's got to be like 10 grand for one of those or more. Um, then maybe someday you'll want to do that. But for a thousand bucks, for the combination of a tube preamp and a tube microphone, you're not going to get anything spectacular. That much I know. Okay, uh, next question. Okay, Jeremy Webster asks, I'm new to taxi as of last week and I'm excited and am excited to, to really get to work. I've got three questions for you that I thought might help myself and hopefully the rest of the community out there, which is what we love about Ask Michael Anything. Um, I want to be prepared when opportunity comes a knocking. Uh, so what if we post to a listing uh, in the library contacts is for more of the same, but we don't have a backlog in that style ready to go? What's the best way to handle it so they know they can depend on us to be productive in the future? Um, that's a really good question, very intelligent question. And here's what I would probably do. Uh, first of all, honesty is always the best policy. You don't want to lie to people. Um, but you could say, I don't have anything at the moment, but I'm working on some because you will be as soon as you hang up the phone or answer that email. So that's probably what I would say is I don't have it right now. Look, the chances of them needing 10 more an hour from now, pretty small. There are occasions where they're pitching to a particular thing and they want several examples of a certain kind of a certain genre, a certain type of sound. They can find that from other people as well as you. So it's not like they're relying solely on you unless you were doing something that is just so incredibly rare and unusual, which is a rare case. So the best answer is the honest answer. And the honest answer is, I don't have more ready to go at this moment, but I will very soon. How soon do you need it? And hopefully they'll say as soon as you can get it to me. Take that to mean a week, 10 days at most not 30 days, not 90 days, not a half a year from now. And don't kill yourself with over perfection, uh, over perfectionism syndrome, which uh, go back and listen to the thing that they liked, that they picked up and set that as the bar for your quality standard. Don't try too hard to exceed it because time is of the essence. You want to get to them relatively quickly, but if you get become overly picky about what you're doing, going, I can beat that, I can beat that one, I can beat that one, pretty soon you get caught in this whirlpool of perfectionism and you end up sending them nothing at all. The best thing you can do is to deliver <clears throat> something. Excuse me while I take a drink to wet my whistle. And now a word from our sponsor, Rockstar. And while I'm at it, I always forget to hold that up. Bria's thinking, why didn't he say he's, I'm kicking him under the table? It's because you haven't yet today. Uh, okay, so where was I? Um, post to a listing. Okay, so now we answered the first question. Second question For cues, should we be mastering our tracks? Maybe using a service like Lander. I feel like we have to consider that they are likely to master the final audio at the end of the mixing of the show, movie, or commercial. <clears throat> um, you know, it depends what your definition of mastering is. First of all, there's great mastering software out there now um, that you can buy inexpensively. Um, just keep in mind that mastering is a separate art form. Um, I've known some incredibly good mixing engineers that would suck at mastering. I've known some great recording engineers that would suck at mastering. And I've known some mastering engineers that couldn't engineer their way out of a wet paper bag when you put them behind a Neve or an SSL console. So it is its own thing. There are some people that are able to do all of it. The thing to remember is mastering for records is pretty different from mastering an instrumental cue for a music library. While they both use overall equalization and they both use overall limiting or compression and they are both going for the desired effect of maybe adding a little apparent loudness, 
um, and evening it out. You know, it's maybe the finished mix is a little brighter when you go back and listen to it the day after. You go, eh, it's a little brighter than I wanted it to be, or the kick and the bass really aren't where I need them to be but rather than remixing the whole thing you just want to add you know like 2 dB at 100 Hertz to add a little fat on the bottom end uh, maybe you want to roll off a little low mids and four five six hundred somewhere around there 700 um, those things are all components of mastering if you're doing it for records guys who master records generally speaking are trying to take Mixes that come from disparate sources. I think the air conditioner's off again. It's getting toasty in here. Um, they're, they're taking stuff, you know, one thing could be mixed by Rob Shirelli, another thing could be mixed by me, another thing could be mixed by Bria, all recorded by different engineers done in different studios with different instrumentation. You don't want the tracks to have different levels and different overall tone signatures. You want it all to sound like it's on a cohesive, homogenous record and so a mastering engineer brings that overall it sounds the same homogeny I think is a word hegemony <laughs> no. homogeny I'm not really sure about that but uh, that's another episode anyway you want that to be brought to the project so that it sounds the same or similar uh, from top to bottom on a record now as mastering relates to um, cues for music libraries yeah if you can take a finished cue and add just a little bit of overall compression to it and add a little bottom or top or suck out a little middle if you if your ears are that well trained where you can hear that stuff and know what to do with it then by all means um what's the mastering software uh, starts with an o omnis uh, what ozone. ozone yes thank you i was gonna say omnisphere that wouldn't be it um yeah learn how to use it um but it's more about the ear than the gear and we've all heard that before so just know that you can really screw something up too it's a rabbit hole and it takes practice it's not like you can buy the software and by tomorrow night you're going to be a mastering engineer um, that said there are some libraries that will master virtually everything they get in on the intake side um, there are many libraries that put music out in compilations like they will do um, used to be a CD now they, they make stuff that looks like a CD cover but it's actually just a digital file that's a, a, a a combination of like 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 a compilation I mean of all the same genre Let, let's say dramedy so they may do an urban dramedy CD which just means a compilation generally speaking and uh, they will master that because they want it all to sound homogenous so there you go um, couldn't hurt to learn ozone but use it sparingly and really know what you're doing. Um, okay, uh, third question. When to let someone license your song exclusively? Um, I think you mean publish your song exclusively. Um, man, this is complicated if I really go down that entire rabbit hole, but um, okay, publishing deals. There are companies that will ask to sign you exclusively. Some people take that to mean, I'm with an exclusive company. I'm cool, it's like I'm driving a Cadillac. It's not really what it means. Exclusive means that they've got the exclusive right to shop your material. No other library does or publisher has that right. Um, used to be that they would pay you upfront for that right. We'll give you 200, we'll give you 500, we'll give you $1,000 upfront to have an, the exclusive right to publish and shop that song. Because there's such a glut of music out there and the quality has gotten so good over the years with the advent of really good home studios and people using them a lot and becoming quite talented at what they do, um, the companies that used to pay are like, I don't really need to pay because I can get the stuff for no money up front. And then you got to hope that it's the right music with the right company that has the right kinds of opportunities that they can make you money. And it all works out. I would put my music, if I made music, 
in a library uh, with no upfront money on an exclusive deal if I thought it was a really good library that had good outlets for my kind of music. There are some great libraries that are really great at getting urban dramedy placed, but could totally not be so great at getting you know acoustic singer-songwriters stuff out there. Doesn't mean they're not a great library, it just means they've got more clients that need this, less clients that need that. Trails. It's like the 70s. Anyway, um, so that's when you decide if you would sign an exclusive deal with somebody. Do the research. Go on the taxi forum. Don't use the company's name out in public because you will drive a bunch of niggly dupes. <laughs> there, I just invented a word. Um, drive a bunch of crazy people to them and they will be saying, oh, I found you through taxi when they really didn't. So uh, ask other people, you know, th I was offered a deal by this company for this kind of music. Are you aware of any other taxi members or have you personally had success using that company and getting that type of music so um, used in TV shows? Um, Non-exclusive means that you can take the same piece of music and put it in a, multiple libraries. They will usually, almost always, uh, retitle it um, so that they can track it differently than somebody else who's placing the same thing. You will hear people say, oh no, non-exclusive, very, very, very bad. There is the potential that the same piece of music could show up from three sources for the same pitch. And then the a music supervisor goes, I don't know who to pay. Well, what they do normally is, uh, I don't know many music supervisors. I don't know that I've ever met one, frankly, that would say, I don't want that piece of music because it's non-exclusive. And if they had, if they got the same piece of music from three sources, they would probably just say, okay, the first person to get it on my desk was Library A. They're the ones who are going to get paid. And if they're really on top of their game, they would reach out to Library B and Library C and say, hey, just want to let you guys know, I got the same piece of music from three sources but that company was the first one to get it on my desk. Therefore, they're the ones that are going to get paid for it. I don't think anybody would have a problem with that. Um, and then uh, Jeremy says, thanks for all you do. You're welcome. Carrie Cox asks, if you submit to a listing for Japanese flavored soul music. Yeah, I saw that listing go by. I can't believe we even got that listing in. If you, submitted, uh, if you submit to a listing for Japanese flavored soul music with country beats and you don't get forwarded, would you go back and try to improve it based on the critique, knowing that it's unlikely ever to have a chance at being in demand again? Or is your time better spent moving on? Yes, move on. Seriously? I've been in the business for 43, 44 years. I've been running this company for 26 of those years. A week or so ago when that listing crossed my desk, I said, that's when I'll never see again. So there you go. Um, Fire Tiger Music asks a very personal question. What are some of your all-time favorite songs? Well, uh, I've never hidden the fact that I think the best written, best played, best engineered and best produced song in my personal history is Asia by Steely Dan off the album Asia. It's, it's a work of art. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, I love a lot of the Eagle stuff. This is, you know, it, it's all period music from when I fell in love with music when I was in my twenties. Well, I actually fell in love you know, with the Beatles when I was in fourth grade, but, um, I would say that all of us in our 20s, you know, when we're like on the cusp of uh, high school through our college years, that's when we have enough time to sit down and really consume music, where you hang out with your friends and just listen to songs versus letting it be wallpaper that, you know, is in the background while you're doing other stuff. So anything from that era is generally the stuff that I gravitate to, but I hear new stuff all the time that I'm just astonished. I, I think right now we're going through a bit of a renaissance where, excuse me, where we're hearing a, a lot of good music, even though there's a lot of music out there um, that's all beat-driven pop and it does all sound pretty much the same, at least very similar. I do hear some stuff and I go, you know what, that kills that whole thought that there's nothing original out there. I do hear stuff that I think is really, really good. All that said, my second favorite song is a song called You Are the Woman by a band called Firefall. 
it was the first record that I ever got a credit on. I worked on some other stuff before that, but didn't get a credit because I was still a puppy. Uh, but I got an assistant engineer credit on Firefall. You are the woman. They had it was all the guys in the band were guys from famous other bands that came together to form this kind of super group. Uh, they came to Criteria Studios where I worked in the mid to late '70s, and nobody wanted to work with them. They already had the engineer picked out. Um, the producer came with the band. Uh, none of the other assistant engineers really wanted to work with the band because they weren't famous yet. Um, they were individually kind of famous, but they were from bands like the Burrito Brothers and I can't remember some of the other bands, but you know, bands you would know. Um, bands who, guys who are as old as I am would know anyway. And uh, so the front office called me and said, uh, go to Studio A, we just put you on a record with a band called Firefall. And I remember just being so thrilled and I walked down the hallway trying not to run. I was trying to be all cool about it. I walked in the control room and Carl Richardson, who was the engineer, um, had had me in a class while I was starting out wrapping cables and learning how to fill out take sheets and track sheets and all that good stuff. Um, Carl Richardson was teaching a class for the Recording Institute of America, the RIAA, and it was like a basic recording class with a book. I still remember the author's name. The guy it was called like Recording 101 by Robert E. Runstein. I can't believe I remember that 40-some years later. But Carl saw me walk in the control room and I said, hey, Carl, uh, Margie just put me on this record. I'm your assistant. And he said, great, go use what I taught you in the class. I want you to go out in the room and set the entire room up. So I got to pick the drum mics, the guitar mics, the vocal mics. I got to pick where everything in the room went and I came back in the room and I was fully expecting Carl to say, okay, I want you to move this and notice that you didn't do that and put a gobo around that and did you use a roll off on that? And did you use a high pass filter on that? And he looked at me and he said, looks good from here. And he walked out there, he walked around the room and went, mm-hmm, 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 all right. We're good to go. Uh, I can't swear on the show, but let's just say that... No, I won't say it. Anyway, I was very excited, but tried to hide my excitement. And the first rhythm track that they cut was that song, You Are the Woman. And assistant engineers at Criteria were taught, you are there to be seen and not heard. You are there to serve and just keep your mouth shut. And uh, a very... Uh, high pressure environment there was a lot expected of you it was almost military like especially for assistant engineers at that time and i remember um hearing the rhythm track with just a scratch vocal when they did you know like one pass to run down levels or something and i looked at carl and i couldn't help myself i said that's a hit song and he went shut up and the producer looked at me like drop dead where you sit you're 19 years old you don't get a vote and, and the song was the first single and it was a hit and the album went platinum and they ended up having like six or seven platinum albums. To this day, just this just recently happened about three weeks ago, I was in the Ralph's grocery store in my town out here where I live in LA and I heard You Are The Woman and remembered that whole thing. So that's my other favorite song. Um, uh, Ken Pagoda, or Gordon Pagoda asks, unlike a song needed for a specific scene, sometimes your pitches are for song plugging companies looking for songs to put in their library. These examples are given because that's your format, but your screeners tend to only forward songs, even for these pitches, that are really close to the three examples. However, having gotten songs placed with many song plugging companies prior to to recently joining Taxi, I've found that most companies are looking for a broader category than just songs that sound like the three examples given, uh, uh, for example, Rita Ora Anywhere, Justin Bieber's Friends. In such cases, can you or do you instruct your screeners to be more broad scoped and forward songs that fit the genre or the subgenre, even if not like the three song examples? It's a totally different situation for a record producer's library or a movie scene that needs to be synced where a very specific song is needed? The answer is, yeah. Not only do we tell the screeners, hey, uh, sometimes we'll say, you know, you can be a little loose on this one. Sometimes we'll say you need to be extremely stringent on this one. But to some extent, the burden is on you guys um, to understand. When we give you three examples, um, 
if it's for a song that is being sought for a particular scene in a movie, the examples are probably going to be somewhat tighter. Uh, you're right, than if a production music library, what you're calling song pluggers, um, they're looking for a certain genre because they need more of it in their catalog. But just know that we have asked them in many, many cases, the, the examples that you see are what they gave us. And you'd be shocked. That's all I could tell you is you would be shocked if you were to sit in a screener's chair and listen to stuff. Sometimes they're looking, the screeners are looking, we're looking and our clients are looking for what would fit on a playlist with those other things. Remember that. Look at the wording in the listings. You'll see stuff that would be on a playlist with this artist, that artist, and that artist. That doesn't mean that they're looking for stuff that's exactly like those three artists or even has all or many or some of those elements. What they're looking for, let's say it's party pop. Um, they're looking for other songs that would play in the... Whoa, that was weird. Our lights just went out. Um, and the air conditioner just went off. But the lights above me are still on. That is weird. Computer's still on. That is so weird. It's got to be the cable. Oh, you probably knocked it out oh, with your I foot. Okay. Sorry. Anyway. Um, okay. Yeah, there we go. Whoa. Lights, Hi. camera, action. We are Hi. back. Um, okay, so... The answer again is, um, if they're looking for party pop for a scene in a movie, they're looking for stuff that would be played at that party. They're not looking for songs that emulate the example songs so closely. There are other times where they're looking for a replacement, where they do want something that isn't a copy of or a clone of, but does have many of the elements like we were talking about before like you know a raucous drum part a uh, distorted raucous you know guitar part so read the listings a little more carefully because we work extremely hard to make sure I, I mean the listings do you know that our listings now go through four or five people before they ever hit your computer they go through the person who gets the email from, let's say, the library. Um, that person then dissects the notes and then reaches out to the library to say, so you weren't very clear about this. I just want to make sure you are looking for blah, blah, blah. Yes, I am or no, I'm not. So they do that first round of analysis, if you will, and clarification. Then it gets handed off to the person who does the first draft of the listing and that person works in conjunction with at least one other, sometimes two other people, to dig up references. We usually get at least one reference from the listing company. Sometimes as many as all three come from them. But at a bare minimum, we get one reference, and then we go to great lengths to find other stuff that works well in the context of that reference. So that's the, the intake person who does the clarification. The listing writing person works in conjunction himself and usually one other person, sometimes two other people, will do finding other songs or instrumentals that match. Um, then the listing goes to two other people who then proof the listing looking for anything from typos to does this make sense? And I am always imploring them to remember, read it like a member read it like an uninitiated member read it like a member who is brand new to taxi not a seasoned member who can read between the lines write it for dumbos <laughs> you know i mean i'm not saying that disrespectfully people who just don't know you've got to assume that some percentage of the people reading a taxi listing are brand new to this and they don't know they they don't know how a music supervisor what they don't know the difference between a featured song or a background piece of music or background source music or an instrumental cue versus an instrumental they don't know those nuances so we have to literally put that information in the listing so after it goes through all that stuff then it comes to me and then I double check it and I walk down the hall to their office and go guys if I were a new member and didn't know the stuff and I read this, it wouldn't make sense to me. And then we all confer and put it out. 
So it goes through that much work for every single listing that you see. Um, okay, uh, got time for a couple more and then we are done. Wow. We've got time for like one more. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go a little long. I feel bad some of these answers have been really long, but mm -hmm. I enjoy having the ability to give deep education. Um, hey, Michael, I've heard uh, you and your guest speakers mention that you need about 1,000 to 2,000 instrumental cues to support yourself through music licensing. But does that number change if all you do is songs? I'm under the impression that songs get sync fees, whereas instrumental cues generally don't. Um, so basically, do you need less songs to achieve the same level of income? And what's the magic number uh, or a ballpark? Um, you're absolutely right in that songs generate sync fees, oftentimes, most of the time, um, and instrumentals don't. However, let's take an episode, uh, an episodic drama, um, a TV show, I'm trying to think of a TV show. I, I want to keep referencing Homeland, but that's not a good... Oh, you know what? Um, Billions, which is on Showtime. Great show. If you're not into that series, you need to be. Great use of music, by the way. That show is an hour long, which means it's uh, like 42 minutes or 44 minutes. Um, and it's got, generally speaking, somewhere between three and seven songs in it. Now, a reality show has generally 80 to 100 instrumental cues. So the odds of you getting something used in, uh, in a reality show are 12 times, 15 times greater than getting something used in a drama. Now, an episodic drama will pay 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 bucks to license a song, whereas a reality show generally pays nothing to license a cue. Honestly, the best thing you can do is don't worry about this metric of, I need to have 126 songs in my catalog to start earning money because it just won't work out that way. Um, you could have 126 singer-songwriter songs and that genre is out of fashion for the next three years. You've got the headcount, but you don't got the income. Um, you could have 126 really great hip-hop songs and you could have the income so there are other variables at play other than just the number or the head count of songs my if i were you guys if i were just starting out as a taxi member i think what i would do is what some of our more experienced and bigger income earning members do which is i would do a mixture of instrumentals and songs um, it accomplishes a couple of things. It, it gives you some variety to pitch. Um, just understand there are going to be far fewer opportunities for the songs, but they will make more money. Harder to get those you know, placements because there are far fewer slots, and the bar is often higher. They're going to think a lot harder about a song that's going to be featured up front in a TV show versus a piece of instrumental music that's a, you know, a little dramedy cue going on as somebody's sneaking around a window. They just do. They give it a lot more consideration and the choices get tougher. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is it goes back to what we talked about earlier, which is it feeds your creative beast. Doing a mixture of instrumental cues and songs, you get your jollies by, you know, you earn your income with the cues, get your jollies by doing the songs, and yay, every now and then you get a song place, and that's really rewarding when you can sit on the couch with your family and your friends and go, that's my song. I wrote that. Um, it's got to feel ever so slightly better than that's my dramedy cue, but that's pretty rewarding as well. So I hope that helps. Uh, Jane Hassler asks, me and my two songwriting collaborators have recently begun to write together. Uh, we don't have access to great vocalists to record the songs. We write and record somewhat slowly on a basic online recording system. When I first discovered Taxi, the hints and tips given were not to worry too much about the production and simple recordings are, in fact, okay. I notice more and more of your um, listings ask for compelling vocals or make much of strong vocals or the vocal performance. And listening to some of the real submissions that you play on the show, um, sh 
some of the stuff you play and showcase on the on the taxi tv episodes i can hear that some of the vocalists and performances are amazing and beyond what we can produce for our submissions as three new aspiring songwriters so my question is what advice do you have on that well first of all everybody you've ever heard on this show that's great started out exactly where you are right now people do not pop out of their mommies born with a bunch of talent and a you know instant great voice and the ability to sing a hit song uh, you may have some natural talent some natural gifts but it's got to be learned and, and, and you know everything great you don't become a great pitcher in baseball without throwing a million pitches you don't become a great golfer without swinging the club a million times you don't become a great vocalist without singing for years so uh the best thing you can do is while you're working on getting your vocal chops up take advantage of the road rally take advantage of the forum take advantage of the chat room on taxi tv to meet other members um uh adriana lisette uh is probably still in the chat room um oh gosh who's uh, there's several members several well, of course i'm speaking of female members now there are members of both genders that will work with other members some do it for cash and carry stuff um some people become collaborators on stuff and they do it for a percentage generally speaking if you're just starting out your music's probably not at a level yet where people are dying to work with you on a percentage because they know the odds of something panning out and generating income for them are not that great yet so offer maybe to pay them a little taste to record for you um the reason that vocals matter more now than they did three years ago or five years ago or 20 years ago is that the bar has just been raised over time because people have the luxury of working endlessly on their vocal craft because their studio is in their house and they're not paying 200 bucks an hour for the record plant. So they can sit there and just keep refining and refining and refining. And I believe that there are more great vocals out there because of that. So that has raised the bar. Plus, there are so many people that are making really high quality demos that they're not even considered demos anymore. They're more like records. And that's what you're competing against. That said, I don't want you to be depressed or discouraged. Just know that there are still some people. Um, my friend Rob Shirelli, who's a two-time Grammy winning um, engineer, producer, mixer, that's got at least 100 gold and platinum records to his credit. Oftentimes, he wants to hear stuff that is stripped down because he's looking for the essence of the song. And it's not infrequent that we see that mentioned in our listings. So just know that, look, even if you're sending in a piano vocal demo or a simple guitar vocal demo, as long as it's cleanly recorded and pretty good on the time and the feel, um, you still want to have a vocal. Even if your voice inherently sounds pretty bad, sometimes a poorly a person with not a great voice infuses so much emotion into their delivery of the vocal that it's kind of like the willie nelson so there's a lot to be said for emotion um there's also a lot to be said for a crappy vocal so take that with a grain of salt um jim gardner asks when taxi asks for submissions for a specific project is taxi the one and only source that the music supervisor slash ad agency will choose from or are there other sources that are also in the mix most of the time it's other sources as well um but um, i mean i could think of the two or three things that are out there running right now in our listings where we might be the only source i mean generally speaking not um but for instance, I can think of a music supervisor that does like movie of the week kind of stuff. And when by the time he comes to Taxi to look for songs for those movies, um, he's already hit his regular, you know, like list of contacts. And he goes, oh, crap, I can't believe I didn't think of Taxi. So by the time he's reaching out to us and because he used to be a screener here, um, he knows there's a really good chance he's going to find what he needs through taxi. So he may not be running that listing elsewhere. There are other times that um, we could be one of five entities, 10 entities, 20 entities. Um, when a big time music supervisor is looking for something for a hit TV show, 
they will literally go through hundreds, if not maybe a couple thousand songs. And they can't get it all through Taxi. Um, we're honored to be one of the sources that they use. So hope that answers it well. Um, Douglas Tina asks, my question is from a songwriter. My question is, I'm a songwriter from Louisiana that's into pop and other genres. Not that many opportunities this way. How can I get heard by any music publishers and A&Rs if there are so many that they have to listen to and choose from? And also, all song pluggers charge a fee. How would I know if my songs are actually getting shopped around and are really legit? Um, there are a lot of companies out there a lot of so-called song pluggers that aren't legitimate. Frankly, um, I, I don't want to say more about that. We've been in business for 26 years. That says a lot about our integrity, I believe, and our honesty, because um, you can't stay in business for this long. Somebody would have busted us for something, and, and they haven't because there's nothing to bust us for. The other uh, incredible evidence, the most incredible evidence we have, is go on our forum at forums.taxi.com slash success stories, and you will see people that are sitting here in this chat room right now that have gotten deals and placements through Taxi and record deals and had hit records. Um, it's not like some people are, are availed to certain listings that you're not. Everybody has the same shot at the same stuff. Same, same listings, same screeners, same companies that we're running listings for. So I can really only speak for us in telling you that we're credible, we're legitimate we don't run crap listings from crappy entities. Um, we vet the companies that we work with and we take what we do really, really seriously, but there are a lot of people out there that will screw you. And all you can do is just assume that's the case, be wary and self-educate, join our forum and ask your fellow members what they know about these other companies, but don't mention the company's names in public. I don't wanna see you get in trouble. But get to know people in the taxi community and, and send them a private message, what uh, commonly referred to as a PM on the forum, and say, hey, I was approached by this company. Have you guys ever heard if they're legitimate or not? Best advice I can give you. Um, okay, and Douglas Tina also asked, and this will be the last question, I'd like to know what's the difference between the ro taxi road rally, the ASCAP Fest, which, um, what do they call the ASCAP? Expo. The ASCAP Expo, um, the BMI, I don't believe BMI has one, and other music festivals. Um, are there long lines? Do they listen to CDs on the spot or MP4s? How can people have a chance with so many others? Uh, at the Road Rally, we work really hard to make sure that everybody who wants the opportunity has the opportunity. The best opportunity you can have is signing up for the one-to-one -one mentors. Uh, a lot of deals, a lot of relationships, and probably a lot of revenue, excuse me, has happened as a result of the one-to-one -one mentor sessions. And yes, the lines are long, but if you get there early and you're at the front of the line, you get really good selection of people. We give you their bios in advance of arriving at the road rally. You get to pick for the most part. Um, if you're in line early, you'll get the um, industry pro of your dreams. And that's how I know. And we don't charge for that. That's free. Other places do charge for that. Um, what do they charge, like 35 bucks or something for that? Yeah, 35 bucks for 15 minutes with an industry pro. You get it for free at the Road Rally. Um, also, we have mentor lunches, which do cost like 33 or $35. That goes straight to the hotel. We don't make any money on that. Um, somebody's gotta pay for the food and, and the waiters and the, the chefs. Uh, and the, that's 30 tables with 10 people each, and we put an industry mentor at each one of those 30 tables, and every 15 minutes we rotate the mentors around the room so that during the course of a mentor lunch, you will typically get to meet and greet and ask questions of probably five or six different industry people. And I'm constantly shocked by, uh, we encourage the industry people to take your music at those luncheons, 
And I'm always shocked about the stories I hear a month later, six months later, even years later. I met somebody at a taxi um, road rally mentor lunch, gave them my CD, and it resulted in a deal. So it does happen. Um, what's What makes the taxi road rally different from the other ones is the spirit of the community. There are a lot of music industry conventions that you can go to that are quality conventions. They are certainly not schlocky by any stretch of the imagination. But the one thing that the road rally has that we've become quite famous for, and I can't take any credit for this, this is all from the members, is the spirit of generosity. You'll, you will undoubtedly meet at the Taxi Road Rally people who have been members for 10, 15, 20 years that are highly successful. Several of them, many of them, um, are, are you know six-figure income earners. And they are so incredibly willing to talk to somebody who's brand new, who's asking you know, ostensibly dumb questions, they will be just as kind to the person asking dumb questions as they are to one of their fellow six-figure income earning members. Um, you can only believe it by experiencing it, but I think that the people in the forum will tell you that. Um, it, it's just really amazing. I, I never could have predicted that the road rally would become as good and, and such a launching pad for so many people as it has. So there you go. My throat is dry. I've been talking for an hour and 45 minutes. Yeah, an hour and 45 minutes straight. My throat is dry. I'm out of the good stuff. Um, that's it. We'll see you next week. I will tell you that I've got um, a music library owner uh, that's never been on the show before. Somebody I have tremendous regard for um, will be joining us in June I've already booked him uh, he's flying in from out of town we've paid for his plane ticket and he's coming uh, I'm really excited about that um, there is a music supervisor I've been trying to get on the show but his schedule is such that it's really hard for him to do Mondays probably until summertime so we'll get him in here um, I keep getting emails from people saying, get Robin Frederick back. We just had her here, but I love when Robin's on the show. So we will get her back. I have no idea what we're doing for next week's show, but we'll let you know. With that said, we wish you a fond farewell. Thanks for hanging in for this long. Uh, thanks for great questions. We'll see you guys next week. Another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Woo! That's going eight. <laughs>